Hi, I'm Heather Marie Montilla, and you are watching PBS Books. Last year, we began our celebration of the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment in the summer, as our nation watched the Americans experiences the vote. So it seems fitting that we close the anniversary year with the celebration of trailblazing women. Specifically today, we are commemorating the life and legacy of Ida B. Wells. Just prior to her 159th birthday on July 16th. We are thrilled to welcome all of you as we partner with the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, ASALA, which was founded by Carter G. Woodson in 1915. Having la launched our partnership during Black History Month, this year we are thrilled to continue our collaboration to ensure that important voices are heard. These collaborations mean a great deal to PBS Books. In addition, we would like to thank our library partners across the country, as well as numerous PBS stations that share this content with their community. But most importantly, we would want to thank you for being here this evening. Thank you for joining us. Tonight's conversation is about Ida B. Wells, told through the eyes of trailblazer Michelle Duster who also happens to be the great granddaughter of Ida B. Wells. This has been a historic year. In fact, just last year, the Pulitzer Prize announced that a special citation was awarded to Ida B. Wells for her outstanding and courageous reporting on the horrific and vicious violence against African-Americans during the era of lynching. Last month, PBS member stations, WTTW premiered a documentary. Let's take a moment and watch the trailer. She was the ultimate agitator and feared because of it. As racial terror reigned over the South. There were close to 200 lynchings in Tennessee alone. A young African-American woman struck back with her pen. She was writing not just to inform, but to shame. She says, I'm going to challenge you on this threadbare lie that African-American men are lynched because they rape white women. She fled to Chicago, where she emerged as a radical black leader. There was never a time when Ida B. Wells was not getting pushed back, especially so in Chicago. And became an inspiration to a new generation. Black Lives Matter is addressing the same issues that Ida B. Wells took up in the 1880s and 90s. You can watch the entire Ida B. Wells featuring Michelle Duster on all PBS Chicago's WTTW platforms. You can also visit the companion website by visiting wttw.com slash Ida B. Wells. Well, this evening we are fortunate to have author Michelle Duster. She recently wrote Ida B, The Queen, The Extraordinary Life and Legacy of Ida B. Wells. Michelle Duster is a writer, speaker, professor, and champion of racial and gender equity. In the last dozen years, she has written, edited, or contributed to over a dozen books. She co-wrote the popular children's history book, Tate and His Historic Dream, co-edited Impact, Personal Portraits of Activism, and Michelle Obama's Impact on African American Women and Girls, and edited two books that include the writings of her great-grandmother, Ida B. Wells. She has written numerous articles for Essence, Huffington Post, Teen Vogue, Glamour, People, and The North Star. Welcome, Michelle. Yeah, thanks for having me. We're so glad to have you. Thank you. We're looking forward to the conversation today. To guide today, today's conversation, we're fortunate to have Dr. Christy Griffin. Dr. Griffin is a retired attorney and founder of the and president of the award-winning nonprofit organization, The Ethics Project, which addresses the impact of crime, incarcerations, and injustice on children and families and the community. 
Dr. Griffin has served on numerous nonprofit civic, educational, and religious boards and is the recipient of multiple awards, including having three times received the President's Call to Service Award and the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Drum Major for Justice Award. She has taught at various universities and coordinated numerous conferences. She is also a columnist and author of two books, including Incarcerations in Black and White. Welcome, Christy. Thank you, welcome. We are, so, we are so thrilled to have you, Christy. Before we begin, could you share a little bit about your work with the Ethics Project and how it relates to the books you wrote? The work that I do through the Ethics Project is really to raise awareness of what mass incarceration is doing to our society and particularly to marginalized communities and people of color who are a disparate representation of those who are imprisoned often for crimes that are either minor uh, or low level offenses or actually were never committed. And it is having a very deleterious effect on our communities, um, wiping out entire neighborhoods, um, separating families from each other. And um, so we do various things to raise awareness of that um, so that the electorate can understand that we can no longer take the same approach to crime of, of do the crime, then do the time, that we have to begin to look at our carceral system and what it's doing our, to our community and begin to take a different direction. Well, you are doing such important work and we're so glad to have you with us to moderate today's conversation. Before I hand it over to you, just a quick reminder to the audience that if you have a question, please enter it in the chat function on Facebook. We will have time for questions towards the end of the conversation. So without further ado, Dr. Griffin, I hand the conversation over to you. Enjoy. Thank you so much. Um, it is such an honor to be asked to um, be any part of um, a recognition of the extraordinary work of Ida B. Wells. Um, I have known of her name most of my life, um, but only recently um, in reading this book um, and exploring a number of uh, the conversations that Michelle has had that I have learned of just an incredible amount of impact that she has had on our lives today and on the lives of so many people um, since her birth in the um, mid 1800s. So, um, I am looking forward to this conversation and asking Michelle some, a number of questions, probably more than we have time for. Um, and the first one is, um, Michelle, you have written previously about your grandmother. Um, what inspired you to write Ida B. Wells, The Queen, The Extraordinary Life and Legacy of Ida B. Wells? Well, I say, uh, first, I just want to say it's an honor to be on the show with you, um, and um, thank you for the work that you do. Uh, I, you're actually um, continuing, you know, the work that my great grandmother was doing and, and um, documenting um, the effects of, um, you know, state 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 sanctioned, really. Um, destruction um, of, of some of our communities and, and people um, in the community. So, you know, this is a very important work. Uh, but what I wanted what I wanted to do with the book, Ida B. the Queen, was introduce my great grandmother, Ida B. Wells, to a, a new audience who were not familiar with her in a way that was accessible um, and connected to what's going on today. Um, and also for those who already knew about her, um, to put her life into the 400 year continuum of the African American experience in this country. Um, I think it's important for people to recognize that my, my great grandmother was part of a community um, and she was also part of a continuum. And to, to see how um, everything is sort of connected and interrelated um, to me makes her story make more sense. So why at this particular time 
did you choose to write this book? It's a very beautifully presented book. The colors that you've chosen, you have archival images in there. You also have um, other images um, that are very colorful and it really appeals to all ages. So you've, you've done this incredible job of presenting your great grandmother in a way that will capture the audience and really draw them in and provide them with so much information that informs of, of how we should be moving forward um, in this particular time in history. Um, so what prompted you to write the book um, at this point from this perspective? Well, there are several things that sort of converged around the same time. Um, one is that the housing community that was named after my great grandmother, Ida B. Wells, the housing the community in Chicago, where I was born and raised, um, started to be torn down in 2002. And so I felt that her name was starting to be um, forgotten in public memory in Chicago. Um, also, you know, the 2020 was the centennial of the 19th Amendment. Um, and so there was a resurgence in, in interest in who she was, what she did. And so I wanted, um, you know, people to remember that she was part of the suffrage movement, as well as, um, you know, being a journalist and an activist. Um, and, and then there was this, you know, right now we're dealing with this reckoning when it comes to um, what our history is in, in this country, you know, with, with the um, controversies regarding Confederate monuments and statues and, um, you know, who, who and how our history is told. Um, I just think that, I just thought it was very timely um, to reintroduce her at this point in our, in our country's history. And your great grandmother was very instrumental in um, achieving the enactment of the 19th Amendment that finally gave women the right to vote after more than 40 years from the time that it was introduced into Congress until it was finally ratified. Um, you would think that there would be a certain solidarity uh, across the board um, with so many other women um, of all races who were seeking the right to vote as well. Can you share a little bit about the experience that your grandmother, Ida B. Wells, um, had during the suffrage movement, uh, not just um, being opposed by the men who were obstructing it, their right to vote, but also encountering those who she was working with. Right, well, I, th I think it's important for people to, to um, understand like where my great grandmother was coming from um, in order to, for it to make sense on why she was fighting so hard for the right to vote. Um, I mean, she was born during the Civil War in 1862 in Holly Springs, Mississippi. She was born enslaved. And um, lucky for her, you know, the Civil War ended in 1865 when she was only three years old. So she grew up during Reconstruction um, in a family um, that was very politically involved and astute. And her father took advantage of the 15th Amendment, which was passed in 1870, which gave formerly enslaved men the right to vote. And so she saw up close and personal, she grew up in this environment, what political um, enfranchisement did and meant. Um, so she grew up seeing um, uh, black men run for office and win um, and um, take control over over their lives in that in that way. Um, and so, you know, it made sense for her to decide, well, you know, women should have the right to vote as well. Um, and so she she um, became involved in that that quest um, later in her life. Um, and when black women had a slightly different experience than white women did when it came to, um, you know, the fight for votes because black women were dealing with both racism and sexism. So within the suffrage movement, uh, there were some white women who were not welcoming um, to, uh, to black women um, being included in um, in that fight, so um, you know she she had her own <laughs> she had her her definitely her battles. Um, one thing that's really well known um, when it comes to her involvement in the suffrage movement was the nineteen thirteen suffrage march, um, where black women were asked to march in the back of the parade, and she did not comply with that and 
um, ended up inserting herself into the Illinois delegation and thereby integrating the parade. Absolutely. I want to um, read just a, a short excerpt, somewhat short excerpt from your book um, that you wrote about your grandmother because the things that she was involved in, again, is just incredible. Um, you wrote that by the time Ida B. Wells reached her mid 60s, she had been a first hand witness to the realities of slavery, the freedom and hope of reconstruction, the terror of post reconstruction, the implementation of Jim Crow laws, the Spanish American War, World War I, segregation, mass migration, riots, and women fighting and winning the right to vote. You know, there was such a, an incredible resilience. Um, you know, you just spoke a little bit about how much, you know, uh, that your grandmother faced. Um, and she went through all of these extraordinary um, moments in history and continued to fight. Uh, can you share what it was about her personality? Where did she get that drive? to be able to take on so many of these exceptional um, challenges and continue to fight for the rights of others? Well, what I gathered while I was researching um, for Ida B. the Queen was, I mean, I can surmise that she she got um, her ideas and her, and her strength and her stubbornness um, from, it seemed apparently from her father. Um, obviously, her mother had a huge influence on her as well, but her father was very engaged and involved in um, in politics. And he was not a politician, but he had political meetings um, at their house, and he would go to political meetings. And I guess there was talk in, of politics. Um, she, I, my great grandmother, in her autobiography, talked about how her father would have his friends over to the house. Um, and and she at a young age because she was the first generation um who were formally enslaved to have the opportunity to become formally educated and so she was surrounded by people who were not um, literate um and so she, her father asked her to read the newspaper to he and his friends um and so can you imagine as a young child being asked to read in front of a group of men um the newspaper and so obviously she I think get you know gained um, confidence and um, you know skills to to read and to um, you know talk in front of groups of people. But she also learned while she was reading the newspaper. Um, so she, even at that young age, was sort of exposed to sophisticated and adult kind of conversations and adult um, topics. And um, and another incident happened when she was a young child where her father taking um, the opportunity to vote, um, purposely um, and intentionally voted a different way than his former master um, told him to in their in the election. And I thought in those days, uh, the ballots had pictures on them because so many people weren't able to read. Um, and so her father voted the way he wanted to, which was the opposite of how he was told to vote. And as a result, um, he, he was a carpenter and as a result, he was locked out of his tools and his house. And her father was not um, daunted, was undaunted by that. And so he just got some more tools and got a different house. Um, and so my assumption, you know, reading into that is that Ida learned at a young age by watching her father that sometimes if you stand up for what you believe in, you might lose something. But that's okay because you, what you what you stand for and what you believe in is so important and it's so strong that you need to be willing to stand up for yourself regardless of the consequences. Um, and so when I just kind of think about you know the different incidents that took place in her early childhood, um, it had to have an impact on her um, and you know on her ideas that. Um, your voice is important, your opinion is important, what you choose to follow, your own convictions are important. Thank you so much for that. Um, can you also um, tell us a little bit about this fire 
that um, is so prevalent in uh, Ida B. Wells' life. You mentioned in another interview, kind of comparing your grandmother to the fire that's in um, Sabrina Fulton, Trayvon Martin's mother, and having this this experience where um, it so deeply the injustice so deeply touches you, and as you st stated, you're unable to find justice in the courts. And because of that, it, it puts this fire in you. And that was really where I um, could relate to Ida B. Wilson. I experienced that same type of injustice where I was not able to find justice in the courts all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. And um, that is what has put that fire in me. Can you talk a little bit more about that and how, if you have any idea of how we can get people more involved in changing those things that we know are unjust without having to have those seminal moments that really um, move us. And then if you could, could share what that moment was um, for Ida B. Wells. Well, so so um, just so, uh, just to back up just a little bit. So my great grandmother, Ida B. Wells, was like I said, she was born enslaved. She was the oldest of eight children, um, and so and she did have the opportunity to become formally educated at Russ College, which was established in 1866, just a year after the Civil War ended. Um, so she was fortunate um, in that way to have that opportunity. And also Holly Springs was an urban area, um, which is a different experience than growing up in an agrarian kind of society. Um, so there are multiple things about her life that I think contributed to her becoming the leader that she did. Um, she became orphaned, unfortunately, at the age of 16. Uh, both of her parents died in the yellow fever epidemic. And so she, she grew up, she took on um, adult responsibilities at a very young age. Um, she ultimately moved to Memphis where she was teaching. Um, she had started teaching in rural Mississippi, but then she moved to Memphis. And she had to commute between Memphis and Woodstock, um, Tennessee, in order to go to her teaching job. And um, when she was only 21 years old in um, 1883, she was asked to move from a lady's car to a colored car on the train, which doubled as a smoking car. And um, so this was significant because she grew up with a sense of hope during reconstruction with a lot of progress. And she had been riding that train for a couple of years before she was asked, all of a sudden these laws were implemented. Um, and she refused to move. Um, ultimately, she sued the railroad on the grounds that the train cars were separate and unequal. She won originally, but then it was overturned a couple of years later when it went to the uh, Tennessee Supreme Court. And so she learned from that experience, that really you know, devastating experience, that she could not get justice um, through the laws, through the court system. Um, and so you know, this, this impacted, I think, the rest of her life as far as how she decided to take things to the court of public opinion um, um, instead of going through the legal court system. What was a real big changing point in her life was in 1892, um, three of her friends were lynched. They were um, business owners, um, law-abiding citizens, um, you know, leaders in the community. And they were lynched basically for being successful um, with a grocery store. So this was a way to eliminate the competition. And that just set her life to a whole other level of civil rights activism, um, where she used her voice as a journalist to expose the violence and the um, hypocrisy of this country. And what I understand, she was very close to, she knew them all, she knew all three of the men, but she was particularly close um, to, who was that, um, Thomas um, Moss? Yeah, um, she was close enough to him to be his uh, daughter's godmother. Exactly. And my understanding that, you know, of course they were supposed to have faced a trial, even though, and, and he believed, Thomas Moss believed, that there was going to be sufficient evidence um, that the courts would give them justice, but they, um, a vigilante group removed them from the jail cells and actually took them down the road and then shot them by a firing squad. 
And I think it's particularly interesting. There are so many things that are similar in the issues that Ida B. Wells was fighting over a hundred years ago and those that are occurring today. And just in this past May, South Carolina's governor signed into law um, this new firing squad for executions. And it seems like we're going back in time um, to this violent behavior uh, of the way that we treat human beings, whatever their condition may be or whatever their behavior may have been, um, that is then spilling out into our everyday lives. Can you speak a little bit about that? I mean, it does seem like, um, you know, some people's idea of making this country what they consider great again um, is almost, you know, going, <laughs> um, you know, I feel like, oh, let's just go back to the 1850s um, is their idea of utopia, I guess. Um, and so those of us who want to continue moving forward versus backward, um, you know, this is disturbing to feel like we're fighting the same battles that our grandparents and our great grandparents were fighting um and you know when it comes to like this regression re regarding voting rights um i mean you would think that so i, I i'm a, a direct descendant of somebody who was involved in this suffrage movement but all of us you know have benefited from all of the progress um, when it came to um, voting rights and so to have to fight for this again. And this is where I think, um, and I'm hoping that when people read the book, they, they will um, feel like they can relate to and see the connection between the past and the present. Because I'm convinced that what part of what made my great grandmother who she was and, and, and do what she did when it came to um, speaking out against injustice and like I said, using her voice as a journalist to expose domestic terrorism um, that this was because it was personal. I mean, her friends were murdered. Um, and I think when people experience something personal, that close up and personal, you know, some people are, are, are driven to get justice for that. And that's why in the book I, I included, you know, Lucy McBath, who lost her son um, to violence, um, and Sabrina Fulton, who lost her son to violence. Um, these these women have taken on this cause to make sure that it doesn't happen to other people's children. Um, you know, Stacey Abrams is picking up the mantle when it comes to voting rights, um, you know, activism. And so among many, I mean, these are, I just selected a few people to highlight in my book uh, because obviously there's not enough room for everybody. Um, but I just wanted the readers to think and hopefully young people to um, say, well, wait a minute, this person needs to be mentioned as well because they're doing the same thing um, as some of the other people that were mentioned. Absolutely. And one of the other issues, very serious issues that we are still facing today is the 13th Amendment and the exception to the 13th Amendment, which you write about in your book. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? We have seen recently over since private prisons have entered into their first contract with the um, United States, we have seen an increase of over 500% of incarcerations um, as a so-called means of keeping us safe. And very clearly it is not keeping us safe. Um, it has grown into an $85 billion industry that is destroying families. Um, how do you see or do you see a correlation between slavery prior to the Emancipation Proclamation in the 13th Amendment and what has evolved and how the 13th Amendment, that exception that slavery was abolished, except for the commission of a crime for which a person has been duly convicted? Absolutely. I do see a connection um, because there is profit. Um, you know, behind both of it. And so people, this country has set up systems so that there is a profit, um, a profit uh, driven kind of economy based on oppression um, and, and um, on every level, you know, of the carceral state, there is profit. 
Um, you think about some of these small, some small towns, you know, I remember when there were almost like bidding wars between small towns that had lost some of their um, economy to, you know, um, a variety of, of reasons. And there was like almost a frenzy of, well, let's get a prison, you know, because that will employ people. Well, what does an employee, it doesn't just um, imprison human beings, it, it drives economy because you have who gets the food um, service um, contracts, who gets the, the contracts for all of the, um, all of the uniforms and who gets the cleaning and I mean just on and on and on there's so many contracts that are involved which involve money and so there's a there's an economic drive um, to basically profit off of um, imprisoning you know certain segments of our community of our of our citizens and um, unfortunately you know our, our, our country is still um, disproportionately oppressive to people of color. Absolutely. And there are also um, two other related consequences of mass incarceration, minimally to others, um, other than providing an economy for the entire country and then for those communities that actually house the prisons. Um, one goes back to another issue that um, we've talked about before, which was um, voting rights. And in so many of those states, people who are incarcerated, um, they are, A, they're being counted for the purposes of the census and distribution of funds in those communities where they are being housed in a prison and taken away from the community of their actual residence. And then, they have also lost the right to vote in most instances, at least while they are in prison. And then for some time, once they are released from prison until they have completed their um, their parole or, um, and I'm drawing a blank right now, but um, those are just other ways that prisons, and then also once they are convicted of a felony, then these individuals can no longer possess a gun, which, under normal circumstances, I would be all for, except that other segments of society are being armed um, with multiple firearms. And then there are so many in this disproportionate number of African-Americans who, who are being incarcerated and either they do arm themselves and then end up being convicted again for having a gun while um, being a, a former felon or they are not armed. Um, so can you speak to those issues that are related to the 13th Amendment and related to this current carceral system that is impacting particularly uh, communities of color? Well, I mean, one of, one of the goals that I had with I Be the Queen um, was, you know, for the reader to see parallels. Um, between some of the fights that my great grandmother wa was, um, you know, involved in, and what is going on today, um, you know, we we are living in um, a society where um, there just seems to be a vested interest in, um, you know, disenfranchising and oppressing people of color, disproportionate to our. Um, you know, to to the, the numbers that we have, the percentage of the population. Um, and then at the same time, on the opposite end, um, you know, limiting the, the number of opportunities that there are um, to actually um, succeed and thrive. You know, it, when you look at, just say, the number of, of people uh, of color who can get business loans, um, you know, who can buy pro uh, property at some, at low interest rates, and you know, all of these um, different kinds of um, dynamics that are remnants of what my great grandmother was was dealing with. Um, there, you know, and, to, and, and you know, my hope is that people will see, it, um, you know, the connection between what is going on now and what is what was happening 100, 150 years ago. Um, you know, because we still have a segment of our population in this country who um, their idea of a perfect, you know, union is is uh, to 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 stand on um, 
and, and oppress, you know, certain groups of people. Um, and so that they can always be on top without there being fair competition. Um, and, and, you know, so this um, drive, you know, to continue on with, with these systems. And, you know, I mean, this is what's, you know, this whole idea of like, you know, this assault against critical race theory, but that's what it is. The critical race theory is about examining the institutional and systemic um, issues that have caused these disparities um, in our country. It's not about, you know, making somebody feel bad about themselves, but it's actually um, examining and, and um, you know, and, and looking at how do these disparities happen? Why have they happened? What are the policies that have that have been put in place? And this is what my great grandmother was doing. She was she was, um, you know, helping people understand that what was happening regarding lynching was not some one off, um, you know, crime that was happening, and, and so that lynching was being um, inflicted as as an actual um, punishment for a crime, but it was a system. It was state-sanctioned violence against communities um, based on ways to oppress people financially and um, politically. Because a lot of times what she found was that the people who were being lynched were the leaders in the communities. So if you get rid of the leaders or you intimidate leaders, then you know the rest of the community feels like, oh wow, well, maybe we shouldn't try for this or strive for this or or if you or if you do decide to go into certain situations, you know you're putting your life in danger. Your great grandmother was a writer. She was a publisher. She had her own um, newspaper, uh, which unfortunately her um, printing um, press and all of um, the related items that she needed to continue that work was actually destroyed. Um, last year, Ida B. Wells was posthumously presented with the Pulitzer Prize long after um, she left us. Um, what did that mean to you? And then also the honor of having um, the monument light of truth. Um, can you give us a little bit of insight into both of those um, honors and what that meant to you and what it means to her legacy? Well, the Pulitzer Prize special citation you know, was I mean, absolute honor for her to be recognized 89 years after she passed away. Um, and so to me, that showed that her, um, that the work that she did was is almost considered timeless. Um, and uh, unfortunately, um, unfortunately for us, um, fortunate for her, um, is considered relevant. Um, you know, that, that the work that she did, I mean, it was 90, 89 years after she passed away, but it was about 120 years after she wrote. Um, some of the pieces. And so for, for work that was done that long ago to still resonate today um, shows the, the timelessness of her work and the relevance of it and how it, it is um, connected to today. I personally think that the writing that she did with the um, newspaper articles and pamphlets leave for us today in 2021 a firsthand account, um, primary sources for us to read what was happening during that time. She was there front and center um, to witness and document this, this um, you know, horrific practices of lynching. And I, I think most people today don't realize how absolutely brutal lynching was. And I, I'm guilty of that. I didn't know until I started doing research, um, you know, several decades ago, actually, um, just how a violent and brutal um, lynching was. I mean, it wasn't just hanging; it was torture. Um, they were some of these lynchings were done in broad daylight with crowds of ten thousand people. Um, newspapers were complicit in advertising for like, "Hey, come watch the lynching." Um, people brought their families; they brought their children to watch somebody get killed. Um, and so, this is our country. This is our country's history. It's real, and some people want to deny it, but you can't deny it if you actually read the documents, and that's what my great-grandmother contributed to this country 
firsthand documents of what really happened. Now, as far as the monument, I've worked on a committee um, in Chicago for 13 years since 2008 to have a, a monument created in Chicago on the land where the Ida B. Wells homes once stood. There was a huge housing community, public housing community named after her, which opened in 1941, and it started to come down in 2002. So for over 60 years on the south side of Chicago in Bronzeville neighborhood, which is where Ida actually lived, um, these homes were very prominent. And when they started to come down, I felt, um, you know, concerned that her name would start to disappear from public memory, you know, with the buildings. And I felt that was that was unacceptable because she, Ida, was not a building. She was a woman. Um, and luckily, the um, residents of the, the Ida B. Wells homes felt the same way. And so for the past 13 years, um, until we unveiled this, um, we had the dedication ceremony on June 30th, 2020, just a couple of weeks ago, um, we, we got this monument um, <clears throat> installed on the land where the Ida B. Wells homes were. And Richard Hunt, um, who is a Chicago-based, world-renowned sculptor, sculptor um, is the one who did the work, which we felt very, very um, strongly about having. He was our first choice um, to do this because he himself is, a histor in my opinion, he's, he's a historical figure himself. That is an absolutely beautiful monument and very well deserved. Um, it, it, just, it stands so stately, um, even above the trees, and it speaks highly of what your grandmother meant to the community and what she meant to all of us in this country and how she paved the way for others to be able to have that courageous voice to speak out against the injustices that so many people face. And, and now I believe many of us are feeling the impact and the trauma of just the day-to-day -day discrimination and oppression that goes on um, in our everyday lives. Um, and the work continues, the same issue that your great grandmother fought you know, well over a hundred years ago is still going on. Um, the voting rights issue are still going on. We see the state of Texas, of what's going on there and the other states that have um, enacted these um, very strict um, voting right laws or in the case of Texas, attempting to enact those laws except for um, the extraordinary acts of, of many of the legislators who actually left the state to avoid that um, happening. Um, so we are continuing these same struggles today. Can you speak to the importance? There are still many people who don't believe in voting. Um, they don't understand why people die for the vote. They don't understand why people heal for the vote. Can you share in these last few minutes, um, can you appeal to others um, the significance of why your grandmother devoted so much, uh, great grandmother devoted so much of her life uh, to voting rights and why it is still important today? Well, it was pretty clear, um, Christy, that my great grandmother believed that we, we meaning women, um, <laughs> uh, needed to have, I mean, just to put things in perspective, my great grandmother, Ida B. Wells, was 58 years old before the 19th Amendment was passed in 1920. Um, now, luckily, she lived in Illinois, and Illinois gave, granted women the right to vote in 1913 when she was 51. Um, but still, she was in her 50s before she had the right to vote. Um, so before that, I mean, she she had founded, uh, co-founded the um, National Association of Colored Women's Clubs in 1896, which is how women who did not have the right to vote, which was all women, um, with few exceptions, there were a couple of um, states in the far western part of the country that granted women the right to vote. The other thing people need to remember is that the, the right to vote was granted state by state, the same way that in our time, um, states have enacted the um, uh, legalized marijuana <laughs> or how we legalize same-sex marriage in our in our lifetime, right? It's state by state, and that's how women get, gained the right to vote until 1920 when we became national. Um, but, but she felt very strongly, and women fought for over 
you know, 70 to 100 years, depending on when you decide, when you want to consider the, the actual, absolute beginning of the suffrage movement. Um, but, but she felt very strongly that in order to have full citizenship in this country, you have to be able to choose the people who are making the laws. Um, and that was the whole point of having the right to vote, is to choose the people who are actually enacting the laws. And that was very obvious once um, in 1914, right after she, one year after she founded the Alpha Suffrage Club, which was an all black suffrage organization in Chicago, um, she canvassed the neighborhood, which was the second ward at that time, and registered um, women to vote and she actually had to convince some of the husbands of the women, like, if you let your wife vote, you know, then we as the people in this community can choose who will represent us as in the city. And so as the result of that empowerment, um, Oscar de Priest uh, was elected as the first African-American alderman um, in the city of Chicago in 1914. And he ultimately went on to become a congressperson in 1928. And this is all because of the, having the um, empowerment um, when it came to having the right to vote. Thank you so much for that, uh, Michelle. This has been wonderful to be able to interview you and hear your responses. Um, and again, it, the book is, you know, it's, it's a beautifully written book, um, very appealing, and I encourage everyone to really delve into it and learn from the life of your extraordinary great grandmother. Thank you so much. We are going to now take some questions from the audience. Before we begin the questions, I just wanted to say that the conversation has been amazing. Um, for you to make it so personal and to discuss the importance of primary documents that your great grandmother wrote and then to know and, and I say this because I feel like this, this book is unlike a book I had when I was growing up. And when you think of this book as a way to activate a young person's enthusiasm, right? You have primary source documents. You have you have a chapter on modern mavericks that even has you know these gorgeous imagery of Muhammad Ali and. Um, other other people and i almost want to know how you even were able to pick the people you included because i feel like in so many cases you hit the nail on the head in, in including people yes of course you left out some some of some people <laughs> but it, that's there's so many amazing mavericks today and and so maybe before we jump into audience questions um oh here here is ali right there um and that's right after and the imagery in this, it makes it really fun. You know, for me, learning is fun to have 400, a timeline, if you can all see that, of 400 years of progress. I think, to me, making learning fun is part of it. And, and I think you've done this amazing job. So if you could talk a little bit about maybe the, the layout and the artistry and those choices, because everything you and and dr griffin have discussed is is exactly why i'm excited about this book and getting this message out to not only us adults but young people because it's it it, it can be read by them so can you share a little bit about your process and how you picked people and that uh, <laughs> well i mean the, the point of the book was to um present my great grandmother's life in a way that would be relatable to people today. Um, and, and to help people see how what is happening today is connected to the past. And so the past isn't this like, you know, stale, boring, um, you know, kind of um, torturous type of thing. I mean, it's like alive and it's it's relevant. And, um, you know, and so, I, and I also wanted to help people understand from my point of view, what, um, you know, the, how people today out after my great grandmother, it wasn't necessarily everybody's today. I mean, there are some people that are not here anymore, but the work that they did was a continuation. To me, it's almost like a relay race. 
you know, where one person runs around the track once and then, and then they pass on the baton. And the person who they pass on the baton is still running in that same race. Um, and that's what's happening, like from one generation to another. You have, unfortunately, in some for some of it, it is unfortunate that we're still running the same race. Um, but but people are continuing on what, what she was doing. And it, in um, that one section of the book, I, I, I wanted to create almost like a um, strategies, you know, that uh, break down the kind of strategies that my great grandmother used and all the different um, work that she did and give examples of how people are using those, those strategies um, in more modern times. And so, for instance, you know, taking control of the narrative. She did that with her journalism. Well, people are doing that today, um, you know, in their own ways with street journalism, you know, with um, starting their own uh, blogs and, you know, things like that. That's what they're doing is taking control of the narrative. When it's, it comes to organizing, you know, I used um, um, A. Philip Randolph as an example um, with the um, Pullman Porters, how he organized, you know, the Pullman Porters um, to, to, to fight for their rights. I mean, there's just many examples that I use in the book that with, with the hope that readers, especially younger people, when they when they think about like what can I do to make a difference in this world? Well, here's some things you can do, and I had them um, separated into like different headers, and so that would spark conversation and spark thought. Thank you. So, uh, a question from an audience member, Gail Strong. As a child. How did you come to know your great grandmother's legacy, and was it um, how was it like for you to learn specifically what what she did as as a kid? Well, I always knew that I was related to her. Um, she was presented to me with all the rest of my family members, um, you know, just on my family tree. Um, my grandmother was Ida's youngest daughter, and I grew up with my grandmother and um, and she would talk about her mother sometimes um, but my grandmother really was to me she was a grandmother she was not this you know walking encyclopedia that was always talking about her mother um, but she would tell us that her mother was you know a journalist that she fought for um, freedom justice and equality um, but I learned more details about exactly the level of danger and the level of violence um, of the world that my great, great grandmother grew up in. I was a little sheltered from that. And I think that's a lot of parents do that with their kids or grandparents. They want their, you know, grandchildren to have a happy, <laughs> happy childhood and not be traumatized. Um, but I was in my early 20s when I really started doing more in depth research. I worked on a film, a documentary film, and I ended up doing a lot of research, um, photo research on lynchings. And that's that was the first time that I really had perspective of just how brutal and cruel and appalling and shocking um, lynching really was. Um, and, and, you know, I started delving more into how my, how my great grandmother navigated that world. And it was really when I was about the same age that she was in my early twenties, because that's when she sued the railroad when she was 21, 22 years old. And I was like, wow, you know, I'm the same age as her. So I started to kind of think about my life and what I was doing compared to what my great grandmother was doing at the same age, recognizing that the world that she navigated in was very, um, there was just oh, so many more oppressed, oppressive and violent kind of um, realities in her life. Thank you. Here is a great question. Uh, what would you say to a young trailblazer reading Ida B. Wells' The Queen right now? And what do you think would be most important for that trailblazer to know? Um, I personally think that the most important thing for a young person to know is that they can make a difference and it doesn't have to, I don't, I, I always 
caution people to feel like they need to change the whole world, you know, and make this huge impact. And that feels over like overwhelming and intimidating. I mean, just make a change in whatever environment that you're in. For students, I mean, you can make a change in your school. You know, you can uh, decide that you're going to get a, a group of your friends together and write write to your um, elected official. You can, you know, write write to uh, presidents or of companies, and um, you know, demand some kind of change. You can start boycotts if you want to. You can write pop. Uh, petitions, even online, you can start pop petitions for different things. I mean, there's a lot of things you, you have more power than you might give yourself credit for. Um, and so I just feel, you know, just start where you are on something that really matters to you. Um, and and then if you, you know, want to do more as you, as you move on in, with your life, that's fine. But um, I just, I just think that making your voice heard and speaking up for what's important to you in the space that you're in is makes a lot of difference absolutely great answer well we are at the top of the hour and we need to end the program this has been an amazing hour with two trailblazers michelle duster and dr christy griffin thank you so very much um, for the conversation um, Michelle Duster, thank you for sharing your great grandmother's legacy with us for this gorgeous book, which I I love. <laughs> um, and <laughs> Dr. Griffin, thank you for your work on the Ethics Project, and thank you for sharing your work with us, so we know more as well. It's been a truly incredible conversation, and it's been my honor to have both of you. Um, so we hope we'll see you again. We hope you stay in touch. We want to thank the viewers for joining us this evening. And so from PBS Books, thank you and good night. Thank you.